Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. Chapter 9 Destruction The downward spiral had begun. Our new album, And In This Corner, came out Halloween 1989 and achieved full crickets. In a desperate attempt to salvage something from the mess, we sprinted out onto the road to perform and promote and do anything we could to inject some life into the album, but it was dead on arrival. The winter of 1989 was a progressively abominable <coughs> show. It began with Reddy Rock. He had recorded a bunch of songs, none of which ended up making the album. He was one of the best beatboxers there ever was, and in our live shows he definitely got some of the biggest cheers. But hip hop was changing, beatboxers were becoming less central to the art form. He felt disrespected and disregarded. As a result, our disagreements became division, division became open conflict, until Reddy and I were dang near at war. Clayt started showing up late for everything. Flights, sound checks, meetings. He'd sleep all day and be in a stank mood all night. Throughout the tour, our arguments escalated in both frequency and intensity. In his mind, he and Jeff were the main attractions, and they were carrying me. Me and Jeff are the only talented ones around here. The rest of y'all just riding our coattails, Clay shouted during one of our innumerable collisions. It all came to a head one night in Kansas City. During our show, we would introduce Reddy Rock at about the halfway point. He'd come out, and me and him had a 15-minute routine before he'd go off, and me and Jeff would close the show. He had a grand entrance. I'd be rapping, and at the end of my verse, I'd shout, Ready, Roxy? Give Jeff a hand! I'd dramatically point to the side, the spotlight would come on, and he would do a helicopter sound effect with his mouth that would shock the hell out of the crowd. He could open and close his hand around the microphone, shifting the frequency to give the illusion of the helicopter passing from left to right. The crowd loved it. But this night, I shouted, I pointed, the spotlight panned, but no ready rock. Jeff just kept the beat going, and after another four bars, I said it again. Ready Rock C, give Jeff a hand. Clayt didn't come out. Without missing a beat, Jeff launched into the next track, and we continued the show as if nothing happened. It is unbelievably painful for me as I write this chapter, because these conflicts and misunderstandings had such simple solutions, yet our immaturity demanded that we had to suffer excruciating consequences in order to learn the most basic lessons of human relating. It's so obvious to me today how hurtful it must have been for Clay to go from being my best friend and my creative right hand to someone who was increasingly being excluded and alienated and asked by photographers to step out of pictures. And what's worse, we never even talked about it. But that night, we were two young rams. After our set, I went raging backstage. Where the <coughs> is Clayt? I screamed. I blast into the dressing room, and there he is, sitting in my chair, sunglasses on, calmly eating a bag of Doritos. Man, where the hell were you at? Clayt didn't respond. He just sat there crunching. Why you ain't come out? I roared. He continued crunching. After a few seconds, he swallowed and said, I just didn't feel like performing tonight. I was shocked and incensed, but I said nothing. We stared at each other. Each second, our new reality was hardening. In my heart, he had about ten seconds before the concrete set. Nine, eight, seven, 
six, crunch, crunch, stare, five, four, three, crunch, stare, two, I cool, I said as I turned and walked out. I never called for Ready Rock again. The next night, Jeff and I altered the set. Clayt was standing there at the side of the stage. The part in the show came where he'd usually be called out. We skipped over it and went to the next song. Same thing in Dallas, same thing in Houston, same thing in San Antonio. We stopped speaking. Clayt started riding on other groups' buses, and when he rode with us, he stayed in his bunk. One day, near the end of the tour, we heard a strange sound coming from his bunk. Click, clack, snap. Click, clack, snap. Charlie Mack's bunk was directly above Clayt's. Charlie, irritated by the sound, leaned out of his bunk to investigate. He opened the curtain to Clayt's bunk. Yo, man, what the hell is you doing? Charlie screamed, jumping down from his bunk. Clayt was cleaning a semi-automatic Uzi submachine gun. He didn't have any bullets, but he was practicing chambering around and pulling the trigger. Click, clack, snap. Click, clack, snap. Gone was my high school friend. The easy laugh, the excitement of battling on the street corners around Overbrook, the joy of stumbling onto a new sound. Left in his place was a person I no longer recognized. In my entire life, few things have been more painful than watching someone I love self-destruct. Daddy-o used to say, you can stop a homicide, but you can't stop no suicide. Reddy Rock was making good money doing what he loved. He was performing in front of thousands of people and seeing the world. He had a crew of friends who would die for him. Yet, there was some blind or broken part of him that, for some reason, couldn't perceive the full scope of the opportunity stretching out before him. He had made his way into the abundant part of the Great River, only to scratch and claw his way back to the desert. Throughout my career, I have seen this pattern over and over again. I have given hundreds of jobs to people, many of whom have ultimately cracked and crumbled under the pressure of the possibilities. As the great Negro poet Charlie Mack once put it, pressure busts pipes, homie. We all have to contend with the natural processes of destruction. Everything is impermanent. Your body's going to get old, your best friend is going to graduate and move to another city. That tree you used to climb in front of Stacy Brooks' house is going to crash down in a storm. Your parents are going to die. Everything changes. It rises and it falls. Nothing and no one is immune to the entropy of the universe. That's why self-destruction is such a terrible crime. It's hard enough as it is. When we got back to Philly, Reddy Rock grabbed his bag, I grabbed mine. There were no goodbyes, no eye contact. I watched him walk off down Woodcrest. He never looked back even once. Because of my childhood experiences with Daddy O's destructive streak, I've always had very low tolerance when I recognize similar energies within people around me. The funny thing is, it's always crystal clear to me when I perceive them in others, but I'm as blind as a bat to those same energies within myself. The first and only real single from the third album was called I Think I Can Beat Mike Tyson. I've often used Mike's invincibility at the time as a metaphor to explain the distinction between natural destruction and self-destruction. Imagine you were to secure a title fight against Mike Tyson in his prime. Fearful for your life, you hire legendary trainer Freddie Roach. You commit to the perfect diet, the perfect training regimen. You do everything within your power to prepare yourself to face Iron Mike. 
You step into the ring in impeccable physical and mental condition, and Mike destroys you within 15 seconds. You did everything you could possibly have done, and still lost. You're just not as good a fighter as Mike Tyson. That is a bearable loss. That is what I'm calling natural destruction. But if you were lollygagging during training, didn't really eat right, and let your boy Pookie train you, and then Mike knocks you out in 15 seconds, now you have to face an unbearable loss. You have to live the rest of your life not knowing what might have happened had you done your best. In the back of your mind, forever, you will know that you didn't only lose to Mike Tyson, you lost to yourself. The fight wasn't you versus Mike. It was you and Mike versus you. That's how I feel about the album and in this corner. The music business is fickle. Some records work, some don't. Sometimes there's a track that you think is going to be a hit, and no one feels it. Then the one you weren't even thinking about becomes a monster. That's the natural way, the inevitable ebb and flow of the universe. But if you piss away $300,000 on rum punch and chicken fingers, and your father has to fly in and drag your <coughs> home, and then you throw together a bunch of tracks in your best friend's mother's basement, you're manifesting an unfair fight. It's two against one. It's you and the universe versus you. It's respectable to lose to the universe. It's a tragedy to lose to yourself. The album, and in this corner, flopped. Hard. We were coming off three million records sold, triple platinum sales, and the first ever Grammy Award in rap. Expectations and investments were very high, and we crashed and burned. We knew the album was a swing and a miss, but it didn't become real until we went out on tour again. The crowds were thinner, people weren't as hyped to see us, they were no longer singing my lyrics back to me, and our performance fees were cut by almost 70%. We made it okay in our minds by thinking of it as promotion. In retrospect, I could feel the impending onslaught, but I couldn't figure out what to do or how to stop it and I certainly didn't think it was going to get as bad as it did. By this time, Melanie and I were living in that dreadful demilitarized zone between the bliss-filled old days of romance and hopeful possibilities, and the fast-approaching inescapable days of resentment, rage, and destruction. Trapped in that awful, quiet lovelessness where two people coexist in the same house, but rarely in the same room. Where the air is filled with apathetic words, not yet dripping into vitriol, but purposely devoid of kindness. That unique hail, where you know it's done, but it's not over yet. Me and Charlie were spending more and more time in LA. The second I would land, Tanya would be at the airport with a rental car, keys to the hotel, dinner reservations, whatever I needed. LA girls always seem organized and business minded. They are always fly and always pursuing some kind of dream or opportunity. There was something about the culture of Los Angeles that bred an upwardly mobile mentality. Tanya never asked me for anything. This was just how she got down. She made me feel at home. We knew each other for almost a year, but we never even kissed. I could faintly sense that Tanya and Los Angeles were about to play some significant role in my survival. I guess I was kind of unconsciously locating the lighthouse and the lifeboat for the storm that was darkening on the horizon. Gigi's words were ringing in my mind. Just remember, lover boy, be nice to everybody you pass on your way up because you just might have to pass them again on your way down. Becoming famous is about as much fun as the material world has to offer. 
being famous, bit of a mixed bag. But fading famous sucks. <coughs> I could read the writing on the walls. Some of it was in my own handwriting. I saw the crowd's silent faces at the end of our sets. I noticed how business calls that once got returned in two hours were now taking two weeks or didn't get returned at all. And most alarmingly, my Amex wasn't quite breaking, but it was bending like a mother- <coughs> And in the middle of all of that distortion, the subtle compass within me kept pointing west. Charlie could feel it too. He took it upon himself to push and to dig and to cajole everything within his power to excavate and manifest a more positive future. Charlie was shameless. He would introduce me to absolutely anybody within shouting distance, even people he didn't know. Little Richard! Little Richard! He bellowed across the Soul Train Awards. Then, excitedly to me, Will! That's Little Richard! He with Diana Ross! Come on, get the picture! Dang, Charlie, they talkin'. Just leave him alone, I said, wildly embarrassed. You want the picture, or you don't want the picture? You gotta be seen with people! Then he dragged me over to Little Richard and Diana Ross, and basically listed my entire discography for them. I know y'all heard it. He got a Grammy. Y'all, like, in the Grammy club together. Charlie Mack is bigger than most human beings, and certainly bigger than most people's security. So once he decided he wanted something, like a picture or a conversation, things tended to gravitate out of his way. LA illuminated the limits to my fame. I was huge in the world of hip-hop, but in Hollywood, I was nobody. At a Lakers game, I was nobody. At the Roxbury, I was extra nobody. When Eddie walked in, he shut it down. It was humbling, it was embarrassing, and it was frustrating. I remember one night in LA, the DC Go-Go Band EU, short for Experience Unlimited, was playing at the Palladium. They had opened for us in 1988 and 89, and we had developed a friendship with the lead singer Sugar Bear and the rest of the group. Spike Lee had just put their song Da Butt in his movie School Days, and EU was now the hottest group in the country. Charlie and I planned to take a break from the emotional battery of being nobodies in Hollywood and just go for a night retreat to the world of music. We headed to the Palladium and rolled up to the backstage entrance. Hordes of groupies and fans all pleading with the bouncers about how their cousin left a ticket. But the will call is closed. The usual crap that makes security guards just look over their heads and ignore them. Charlie does his usual thing, stepping up to the front and speaking for me. Hey, my man, I'm here with the Fresh Prince. The who? the security guard says, looking past Charlie to me. I always hate these kinds of moments where I have to stand there and try to look recognizable, because now everybody is staring at you to see if you're famous enough to pass the bouncer test. You're out on a limb, and when you just flopped an album, it's a thin and rickety branch. The Fresh Prince, man. The Fresh Prince. You know, Jazzy Jeff and him, Charlie clarified. The bouncer looked at me with the universal glare that signifies, I'm foraging through my visual Rolodex and, nope, you're not in there. If y'all ain't got tickets, y'all gonna need to move to the back. Just then, the door opens, and Sugar Bear from EU sticks his head out and looks around. I made a rookie error. I overcommitted, but when I saw a familiar face, he felt like one of those round life preservers being thrown to me as I was drowning in a deepening sea of insignificance and irrelevance. Before I could stop myself, I blurt out, Hey, Sugar Bear! Sugar Bear looks right at me, 
there's a moment of recognition. I point at the security guard as if to say, Yo, man, tell this dude to move and let us in. Sugar Bear pauses, looks at the security guard, subtly shaking his head. He scans the crowd to see if the person he was really looking for is out there. They're not, so he turns and goes back inside. I turned and gracefully made the ex-famous person's walk of shame. Inside, I was raging. But as is my habitual emotional way, on the outside, I was totally calm. I didn't know where I was going, but block after block, I just walked. Charlie said nothing, but kept step right behind me. We walked for miles in silence. What the hell was happening? Since we came off tour, Jeff had retreated to his mom's basement. His reaction to the looming winner of our careers was to hibernate. He had turned down a chance to do a show in Africa and a tour in Australia. I was pissed that he was hiding. It seemed like cowardice on his part. And it activated my most violent trigger. I'd been fighting my entire life to not be a coward. I believed that we needed to go head to head with the obstacles that were building against us, but I couldn't do it without him. I felt like he'd betrayed me. JL was complaining about me and Charlie being in LA so much. Y'all are wasting your time. You need to come home so we can get back into the studio, writing and recording, JL said. Melanie and I were barely speaking, and here I was in the empty streets of Hollywood on a Thursday night, anonymous and adrift. Charlie Mack was like an old-time boxing trainer whose fighter had just got his whole <coughs> handed to him in the previous round. If we weren't on Hollywood Boulevard, he definitely would have been pouring ice water down my shorts. I was hurt bad, but I knew I had another round in me. We approached a crosswalk, the red hand beckoning directly to me. Halt. Stop. Breathe. Think. My rage settled. Contemplation churned into passion. Then, a decision. That will never, ever happen again, I said. I promise you that. Charlie didn't open his mouth. He just nodded his head. He knew something profound was happening inside of me, and he was down for whatever. The light changed, and we walked on. I didn't pay my taxes. It's not like I forgot. It was more like, I just didn't pay my taxes. In January 1990, Uncle Sam decided that I'd had enough fun and he wanted his. I owed the IRS taxes on around three million dollars of income. I think somewhere above a million dollars, Uncle Sam shifts from ornery to irritable and everything north of about 2.3 million dollars makes him aggressive and cantankerous. So as was my general approach to problem solving during this period of my life, I dumped it on JL. Wait, you didn't pay any taxes? he said. He was on the phone, but I could tell that he sat down. To this day, JL is the most frugal, sensible, and fiscally responsible person I've ever met. He doesn't spend any money on anything ever. No fancy cars, no jewelry, no trips, no jacuzzi in his bedroom, nor his bathroom. While Jeff and I were spending our spoils wildly, JL never moved from his childhood bedroom. He was taking this very phone call in his mother's kitchen. Nah, nothing, I said. Like, nothing, nothing? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, nah. Y'all are stupid as... <coughs> JL said. Y'all understand this is a big problem, right? I didn't notice in the moment but JL kept saying y'all, denoting a plurality of stupidity. I would later discover that Jeff hadn't paid his taxes either. 
And to make matters worse, JL had been lax on billing us for his commissions, so not only had we spent all of our money, we had spent JL's cut too. We were all broke. JL hired a tax attorney for me and Jeff. He paid his taxes. He scheduled a meeting and showed them the notices from the IRS. He also engaged an accounting firm, Gelfand, Rennert, and Feldman, to oversee our hypothetical future earnings. First went all the cars, then my motorcycles. Stereo systems are very expensive when they go in. They're worth dang near nothing when they come out. Then the excruciating decision was made. IRS, attorney, and accountants unanimously agreed. I would have to sell the lower Merion house, pool table included. I was rich and famous, minus the rich and minus the famous. I was worse than broke, I was in the hole. The walls were tumbling down. I had enjoyed Sodom and Gomorra way more than I was enjoying Jericho. There's a strange thing that happens when someone falls. Your demise somehow proves to everyone you've ever disagreed with that they were right and you were wrong. They develop a smugness and seem to get a brutal enjoyment out of the fact that God is finally punishing you. People tend to have a schizophrenic relationship with winners. If you're down too long, you become an underdog and they feel impelled to root for you. But if you're ever unfortunate enough to be up too long, you better get a helmet. One night, in the middle of what would become the final racks of 8-ball ever played on my first pool table on Marion Road, Melanie came down the stairs. She was looking fine as hell, wearing a royal blue miniskirt and matching leather jacket. She had on 3-inch heels. She never rocked heels. Big bamboo earrings I had bought her that she'd never worn before. Her makeup was perfect. No glasses tonight eyeliner. Her cleavage would certainly not have been approved of in her aunt's house, so why did she think it would be approved of in mine? She pranced through the gauntlet of me, Charlie, Bam, Bucky, and a couple more of my JBM boys. Everybody looked, but nobody made a sound. The JBM had a code. They were always respectful of each other's women. Where are you going? I asked as I missed an easy 11 ball in the side. Out, Melanie said. All I could think was, why the <coughs> is she doing this right now? Is she really going to challenge me in a room full of Philly's hardest gangsters and killers in the middle of the IRS seizing all my <coughs> wearing clothes that I paid for, making me miss an easy <coughs> 11 ball in the side? Where's out, I said, as Charlie lined up his next shot, about to take a hundred dollars that I didn't have. I don't know, she shrugged. Out. I think you're not going out, I said, drawing a line in the sand and trying to save face. You should go ahead back upstairs. Whatever, Willard, she said, as she moved toward the door. If you walk out that door, I promise you, it's going to be a bad look. We stared at each other. Each second, our new reality was hardening. In my heart, she had about ten seconds to go back upstairs before the concrete set. Nine, eight, seven, six. Charlie sunk a high ball on the side. Five, four... Three, eyeliner, cleavage, bamboo hoops. Two, I'll see you later, Willard. Melanie walked out. An hour later, I was in the house alone. Melanie and I were no longer in that loveless, demilitarized zone. The bliss-filled old days were finally giving way to the days of resentment rage and destruction. 
Melanie's taxi pulled up around 2 a.m. I was waiting for her out front. I had collected everything I'd ever bought for her. Clothes, shoes, bags, anything that would burn. I had drenched everything in lighter fluid. Our eyes met. I struck the match. Whoosh! As I write this chapter, I have never seen or spoken to Melanie again. I've reached out on multiple occasions over the years with no response. She was the victim of one of the lowest points in my life. Yes, we were young. Yes, we hurt each other. But she did not deserve how I treated her. She did not deserve how it ended. Charlie Mack was in love with Mimi Brown, one of the most iconic DJs in Philadelphia history. She was the seductive, sultry voice of our childhood imaginings, and seeing her in person did not disappoint. Charlie missed no opportunity to get me to the station. I kept finding myself doing interviews at WDAS-FM on Mimi's show. It was like Charlie was now my publicist, and he had one contact in the music industry, Mimi Brown. This was my third interview with Mimi in the span of two weeks. She had launched a show called Rap Digest. I was running out of things to talk about, but Charlie felt like we weren't quite hitting the critical points we needed. Mimi, oh my god, oh my god, I'm telling you, the people just love hearing y'all talk. Y'all lighten them phones up. We gotta keep doing this, Charlie gushed romantically. Mimi had been an early supporter and advocate for DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. She was one of the first to ever play our records, and she was one of the Philly pioneers pushing hip-hop onto daytime radio and she loved a hometown boy. It was always the same with Mimi. Whether we were hot or cold, big record or no record, she wanted her studio to feel like home. We were always welcome. It was a win-win-win. Mimi got a great interview, I felt respected and appreciated, and Charlie got to shoot his shot. The studio was a cozy little soundproof room with glass on two sides. People within the station could walk by and look in on the interviews and talent who showed up. Mimi and I were always a particularly appealing attraction. We laughed and joked a lot, and we played an interesting mix of hip-hop and R&B that was revolutionary at the time. It felt like a live show as we interacted with the staffers behind the glass. One afternoon, I started rapping live, which doesn't sound like much today, but I promise you, it was jaw-dropping back then. This was one of the first times it had ever happened on Philadelphia radio. You have to understand, this was a time when many radio stations' promotional taglines were all music, no rap. Behind the glass, the crowd grew and started going crazy some because they realized they were witnessing the birth of a new era, and others because they probably thought they were witnessing the death of Mimi Brown's career. As I play and perform to the glass, I'm stopped in my tracks as I realize I'm face to face, eye to eye, with Dana Goodman. He had heard me on the radio and decided to show up. If the mother you're looking for is Will, He's in the house. You're welcome to come in and kill him now. Dana stares, emotionless, and whispers into the ear of the dude with him. The dude nods and moves toward the door of the studio. I keep performing, my eyes steady on Dana. I try to signal to Charlie, but he's staring at Mimi. The door opens. The man enters the booth and stands beside Charlie. Charlie's ghetto radar is once again on point. Charlie slides almost imperceptibly into striking distance. He's no longer looking at Mimi. I finish rapping. The crowd applauds. Mimi and I sit down to continue our interview. 
You need to thank Dana Goodman, the man yells out. Yo, my man, they're live on the radio. Cool out, Charlie whispers. You need to thank Dana Goodman, the man yells out, louder this time. Homie, we can do whatever you want to do outside, but you gonna be quiet in here, Charlie said more forcefully. The dude put his palm on Charlie's chest to shove him away. Tell your man to thank Dana Good. Before his lips could form the first O of Goodman, Charlie cracked him with a straight right hand, dead on the button, and dude's head explodes like a watermelon. It was as if Charlie had shot his fist out of a cannon. The guy crashed into the metal rack holding the 8-track cassettes, scattering them all over the room. Dude was down and out. Charlie grabs me and Mimi and runs us toward the back parking lot. Charlie. Dana's out there, I shouted. Just keep going, keep going, Charlie says. We exit into the back parking lot as station security grabs Mimi. Charlie throws me into the car and we're out. I had never been in a jail cell before. It was way too small and there were way too many of us in there. Frankly, I felt like we all deserved better. Apparently, there is an arcane law in Pennsylvania, the Master-Slave Clause, that states that if one person commits a crime under the control or direct influence of a master, then the master is legally liable for the actions of the submissive slave party. The man's legal team argued that because of my dominant relationship with Charlie, I was culpable for his actions. Charlie was never even arrested, even though it was he who had broken the man's left eye socket and irreparably damaged his cornea. Clearly the man's legal team thought that I was a deep pocket and logically reasoned that I was a bigger financial target than Charlie. The joke was on them, I didn't have a dime to my name. But as I sat in that jail cell, facing aggravated assault, criminal conspiracy, simple assault and reckless endangerment charges for a punch I hadn't even thrown, I finally understood a term I'd heard many times before. Rock bottom. I was literally lying on a cold stone floor. Everything I had, everything I built, the woman I loved, was gone. I was broken and as I lay there in the fetal position, trying to figure out how the <coughs> did I get here, I made the horrific error of clinging to the universal rock-bottom axiom of hope. Well, I guess it can't get any worse than this. Hopefully, none of you will ever need this information, but if you can at all avoid it, do not get arrested on a Friday. I was released on Monday morning. No one gets let out on a weekend. I went straight to Woodcrest to see Mom Mom. I hadn't spoken to her. I was sure she'd be a mess. The crazy thing is, when I saw the police car in front of Woodcrest, it never even crossed my mind that they were there because of me. One of my childhood friends, Little Reggie, had recently become a cop. He had the kind of heart that everybody wanted in a police officer. Reggie was the man in the neighborhood. Mom Mom loved him, and everybody respected him. When I walked in, Mom Mom and Reggie were sitting in the kitchen. She hugged me. Bzzz. Dang it, my shock collar. What the hell has Reggie been saying to my mom? I gave Reggie a pound, we hugged, and caught up a bit. He had heard about everything that had happened with Charlie and my weekend in jail. I want you to know that I got your back, Reggie said. Bzzz. Uh-huh, for sure, Reggie, I know that, I replied. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and I need you to keep it 100 with me. Bzzz. Do you happen to know... He listed four names. All four were guys from the JBM guys I had been gambling with and not taking cars from for the past two years. 
My heart jumped into my throat. I felt like I had to swallow it back into my chest. I might know him. Why? Willard, do you know them or not? Mom Mom blurted, cutting through all my bull- <coughs> Look, Reggie said, I'm here to help. You know what they do, right? What they're into? I nodded. Will, you got a good thing going with your music. Those guys are bad. They're being watched by the FBI, and the feds are about to shut it all down. Word is that they have photos of them coming in and out of your house, of you driving their cars and traveling with them. Do you know that it's a crime to give and take money from them? I couldn't breathe. It really doesn't look good, Reggie said. You need to get away from them, right now. The FBI is coming with the thunder and sending a big rap star to prison would just be a cherry on top. Mom Mom's face was stone, but the volcano inside was churning and boiling. This was exactly why I needed to take my dumb <coughs> to college. You didn't get involved in any of the stuff they did, right? I can't help you if you don't tell me the truth. You clean, right? Reggie said. Yeah, yeah, totally. We just played pool and partied, I said. All right, but you need to lay low for a minute. Maybe get out of Philly. It's about to get ugly. I called Tanya and asked if I could come stay with her for a little while. She was ecstatic. The problem was, I couldn't afford the plane ticket. My Amex was finally broken. Literally. I decided that I needed to take a chance. I called Bucky. We met in Fairmount Park near the plateau. I pulled up behind his black 325i and jumped into the passenger seat. I loved his car. He had the Alpine CD changer that held 12 CDs. When I got mine, I could only afford the 6 changer. I told him everything, that the feds were circling, that I was moving to LA, and that he should leave too. He kinda chuckled, laid his head back on the headrest like he knew that he had been living on a runaway roller coaster that had always been predestined to come to a fiery end. He closed his eyes. We sat in silence. It was about 6 p.m. There was a flight to L.A. in two hours. I hated that I had to interrupt him to ask him for money. Hey Buck, I need to hold something to get out to L.A., I said quietly. What you gonna do in L.A., Buck asked, not even opening his eyes. I don't know for sure. I just love it out there. There's a chick out there I'm feeling. Our album crashed, so... I might try acting. You could definitely do that acting, <coughs> he said, smiling as he seemed to replay some of my funniest highlights. You the dumbest... <coughs> I know for sure. He was laughing out loud now. How much you need? Buck asked. Nothing heavy. I need to get out there, get an apartment, be able to move around a little bit. I, I got 10 G's here. You need more than that, we could run to the spot. Nah, that's straight. Buck had a secret compartment under the driver's seat floor mat. He grabbed the 10 G's, reached into the back seat, shook a tasty khaki butterscotch crimpet out of a brown paper bag, and stuffed the cash into it. He handed it to me, but when I grabbed it, he wouldn't let it go. He looked straight into my eyes. You know you're not better than me, right? He said. Of course, Buck. I know that, I said, somewhat confused. I'm just like you. We the same. He got quiet for a moment, then said, I could do all that <coughs> you do. I just <coughs> up. We just born in different spots. Yeah, that's real, I said. Buck let the money go. Just do right, man, he said. No doubt, Buck. I'ma get this back to you quick. He chuckled again, as if somehow he knew he would never need it. When I get my feet, you should roll out to LA. Bucky chuckled the same knowing chuckle. Sure, man, I'll do that. He gave me a pound. I made my flight. 
three days later, Bucky was dead. <laughs>